episode 76. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archi Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archie Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archie Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archieoffice.com. Well, welcome back, Architect Nation. Today we're joined by Rand Selner. He's the principal and owner of Home Architects. We're also joined by Craig Isaac. He's the owner and principal of Craig W. Isaac Architecture. So, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank nice you. to be here. Thanks, Eno. Yeah. So if I could, I just want to get a little bit of background on each of your firms and what you do. Rand, do you want to start out telling us about your background in architecture and a little bit about what your firm does? Well, just like you, I started out in commercial architecture and probably did about $3 billion worth of that. I was the architect of record with the firm I was vice president of back then. We did about half of Jurassic Park for Universal Studios in Orlando. Did quite a few homes down there and also hospitals, NASA facilities, high schools, water treatment plants, office buildings, just about anything you can imagine, restaurants. And uh, about 15 years ago, I decided to focus primarily on residences. And so I pursued that for a while with why, my Why did name. you do that? Well, I've just always enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm just, it's a love. And so after about five or six years of doing that with my own name, Rand Selner Architect, I realized people probably really don't know me in all the states. I want, I want to, I, I mean, I, I had a national practice and maybe people close to me within 50 miles of me, maybe you've heard of me, maybe. But I thought, gosh, it's awful arrogant of me to imagine that people across the United States have heard of me. So I decided to change the name of my company to something that I thought maybe people might actually want. So I became a home architects and that has been a very good move. So anytime you type that in in your browser throughout the United States, I'm probably going to come up. Yeah. So just for the organic search traffic, it's been a huge win for you. Yeah. All right. And what kind of homes are you doing nowadays? We uh, primarily focus on uh, mountain style homes. And a lot of people ask, well, what's mountain style? It's kind of like arts and crafts on steroids. It's more of a muscular approach with uh, rock and big timbers and bracing and bracketry that's larger than you'd expect to find in other kinds of uh, architecture. Uh, they, they've got up in the uh, uh, New Hampshire, New England area, what they call shingle style, which is kind of a, a less robust version of uh, uh, what I do. But just the same, the shingles are elements that we tend to use also. And some people might even call it parkitecture. A lot of what you see at the uh, national parks like Yellowstone and others like that, except those tend to be kind of rough and we, we try to have our level of detailing a little more refined than that. My, my wife has a term for it. She helps me with the interiors. She calls it uh, rustic elegance. Nice. Craig, tell us about your firm. Give us a background on what you're up to and, and what got you to where you're at. Well, I... I, I came to, to Charlotte from Montreal for college. And so once I graduated in Charlotte, there was at that time in 83, there was uh, really no, no construction going on in Montreal. I mean, it was, it was absolutely dead. And I had actually interviewed for art with architects up there and they offered me positions, but they said they didn't have any openings. And as soon as they had an opening, they'd hire me. And so Charlotte was, was booming. So I stayed in Charlotte and worked for a few different architects and worked for a, a very good residential firm. And I've always been very detail-oriented. I've always enjoyed 
building furniture, building designing furniture, crafting any kind of models and stuff. And so residential has always been an interest. And I went to work, actually left that, that firm to work for two guys that had started their own firm and they ran out of work. And uh, that was 1990 when things in Charlotte really slowed down and I had the option to go back to the original firm and I just thought I'd, I'd try it on my own. So they actually let me go back in, pull whatever drawings I wanted to pull out that I'd worked on while I was with them and, and to use to show for as a portfolio. And 1990, I started on my own and, you know, concentrated on residential work and picked up the odd commercial job here and there. But really, residential is what I've always done. Um, I'll do small tenant outfits and some small buildings. Um, they usually end up being, you know, chiropractor's offices or just some sort of little, little, little spaces, nothing, nothing huge. So the, the big commercial projects, I, I don't think I can handle, but so I've, you know, I've been on my own basically for since 1990 and uh, just plugging away at residential work. Yeah. Can you remember any of the insights you had, Craig, when you first started out back in 1990? Well, I wish I had some better insights, but it's kind of funny because I started, I started with the possibility of two projects that neither of those came through but I ended up getting other projects that basically pulled me through sort of the first year. And then after that, it, it just kind of kept going. I originally had thought that if I went to around North Carolina to these golf developments that were, there's some, you know, some nice areas with golf courses with nice houses around them, that if, if I got into those places that I, you know, I'd probably have a continual work. And so I went around to a lot of different places, left portfolios, had, you know, very good sort of interviews and, you know, very positive and really never got any work out of that at all, except at one one point I got a, a very good project that we started working on, then it was put on hold. And so I never did do anything else in that, that development. But, you know, that was sort of my marketing plan, you know, and, and besides that, I had no no idea. And I think the what a lot of people say is that, you know, a lot of architects, they, they end up on their own and running a business and they've never even taken a business class. I have no idea what to do. So that that's me. I'm a good example of that. So, but you know, I guess you have the passion and you just just plug away. So, yeah, well, that's what I've done. Have, yeah, it's great to have both of you on here. You're both veterans, veteran architects. It's a good good experience under your belt. But the reason we're here talking is because I'm now a member and we've talked about this offline of an association called Architects Creating Homes. And Right. So, I know you two are Tell me, tell me about this this organization. Let's just jump into it. You know, kind of what what needs it filling, and tell me about the origin of this and how it came about. And let's tell our listeners what <clears throat> Architects Creating Homes is. Um, Craig, want me to give this initial part? You, you do it, Rand. You're you, you're the you're the 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 first one that that got us going. So you need to start us off. Are are you okay. Rand? You're the first guy that kind of the is your brainchild. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> but there's there's a couple other fellows that that we uh, used to communicate on another blog board and Edward Shannon and uh, another fellow. And we uh, had some seeds of discontent and I guess we became the rebels. And so we I, I said, well, why don't we start our own organization? People seem quite uh, disturbed by that idea. But uh, I said, I think we can pull it off. Let's. Uh, Let's go ahead and try it. So that was about two years ago, and we seem to be doing okay. Here's the here's the big answer, and I need to kind of look off screen here to look at some statistics. We need to review some statistics to, to really answer why we created Arch and why it's here. And there's been other people that say, it, that say oh, isn't it the same as so-and-so, or isn't it the same as this and so? Well, no, it's not. NCARB, uh, National Council of Architecture Registration Boards, indicates that there are about 104,000 licensed architects in the USA as of 2012. Okay. The AIA claims to have around 54,000 licensed architects as members and about 83,000 people also as members. So what this means is what <laughs> the other shoe hasn't fallen here. What's that mean? That means that... 50,000 architects who aren't members of the AIA. There you go. You said it, not me. I can do my math. <laughs> Just there you that's go. about all I can do, though. <laughs> well, what, what that so it's our belief that about half of the architects in the United States that are practicing are practicing some form of residential architecture. I can't prove that. I can't find those statistics anywhere. Neither NCARB or AIA or other entities that I've been able to find to support that, but I believe it's true. And if that's the case, we 
We believe that Arch is an alternative uh, with a stronger focus only directed toward licensed architects practicing residential architecture. It's sort of like if, if you were an engineering firm that mainly designed bridges, and if there was a structural engineering society consisting of only bridge engineers. It's a question of focus and richness of information relative to what your primary practice happens to be. So uh, we believe Arch also offers an affordable price point, $150 a year, instead of some other organizations that can be more than four times that amount. And Arch is an independent professional organization. 100% of the dues that comes to Arch goes to support the mission of licensed residential architects. None of it's used to support any other type of endeavor. So there are some major differences right there. Yep. And I guess when we talk about differences, we're contrasting it to the other large organization that represents architects in the United States, which is, of course, the American Institute of Architects, of which I'm also a member. Right. And I am, too. Yep. Many, many of our members are. Most of our members are. But I was asked to discontinue my message of saying that it's OK to belong in both, even though it is. That the main message that we're really trying to communicate is that. If you tend to practice residential architecture, if you'd like all of your dues going to support that mission, if you'd like the focus of what you're doing strictly supporting that endeavor, then Arch might be a, something for you to consider. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I know I was talking with David Andreozzi a couple episodes back, and I know that he was someone you guys have exchanged um, you know, comments with over discussion boards, and even <laughs> you know him personally, I'm sure. And he yes. took a different tack. You know, He's a part of the CRAN network, which is a part of the AIA now which is, you know, they're kind of spearheading the change from within, whereas you guys are approaching the change from without. So kind of tell me about the, the two different approaches and the strengths of each and, you know, what motivated you to go for the change without as opposed to the change within. Well, I'm going to leave David to address uh, his approach. I'm not going to step on his toes. So he's welcome to do that. We're friends. Yeah. Um, and matter of fact, we've served on committees together and uh, a, a lot of our intentions, I think, are identical. And he actually was in another organization that was uh, a different than the AIA. And uh, he pursued that for a number of years as well. And he ultimately decided to go ahead and join AIA. And I actually was a member since 1984, off and on. And I've been a member of various committees. Uh, and it's just that I finally felt that things have come to a head where I just thought we needed a fresh break and a new start something that didn't have to ask permission from a parent organization to do things which seemed obvious to us. Um, because when you're dealing with a big corporate entity, things that seem so obvious, you just can't do. And that seemed kind of a path of resistance there that I didn't want to follow. And uh, But I respect that organization very much, and I, I wish them well. Yeah. Can you give an example what, what, of something that might be that a uh, large corporate organization wouldn't be able to do, <clears throat> Rand? Well, uh, we, uh, for instance, we have, uh, we're in the process, we've already trademarked it. We're, uh, we've created a, uh, uh, some new programs that we think are going to be pretty amazing. One is the crafts program, which is, uh, a certified residential architecture program, <clears throat> certified residential architect program, which I don't think would ever get approved in that other organization. I, I respect the fact that they want unification of all architects. I appreciate that. Um, I get that. However, it is a specialty that we're in. And I think that there's been countless comments over the years how I, I keep hearing the words square, white box architecture being uh, winning awards and, and being the focus. And, and that's a, a, a good uh, analogy. Even David agrees with that. And he agrees that that should not be the case. Uh, you can see comments of his on various things out there that that underwrite that. But, but I don't think that would ever be approved uh, within that other organization. I think it's high time it's happened. I think that we're all up against a tremendous amount of uh, economic pressure from uh, entities that don't have a collegiate education, that don't have the right amount of experience, that don't have any internship, that don't have any licensure. And uh, they call themselves certified residential designers. Certified by who? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's the big, the big thing with Arch is that we, the only way you remember is by being a, res, a registered architect. And the, the, the reason to be part of Arch is because your, your main focus is residential work. And so the crafts program 
is a way, I mean, you could still be a member of, of Arch, you know, essentially a regular member, but you can go through the crafts program and be a certified residential architect, which basically says, listen, I want everybody to realize that I've gone through and I've taken all these hours of, of tests to let people know that I know what I'm doing in residential work. And, it, and it's not just, you know, how you design, but it's actually detailing and knowing that things are done properly. And, and it's just basically saying that it's one step up, you know, above. And, and it's, it's saying that I am a legitimate architect and I'm not a certified residential designer. So I think that that's really one of the, the goals on the with the crafts program that we're we're working on trying to develop. There's there's been other people. I remember we did Mark LePage interview and that was that was a nice one. And I know that you two are friends also. He's a good guy. I like him. Uh, you ought to uh, tell him to join. <laughs> yeah. I hope he's. I think he's considering it. But we've had some fallout from some people there that were FAIA. And and they they say oh design an arc design of a house simple that's right nothing. exactly but, uh you know if you're doing it correctly it really isn't and even the AIA itself the entire country of where Craig came from Canada all state governments most universities declare the design of a residence is one of the most complex activities that an architect can engage in uh, I should know I've designed NASA laboratories I've designed high schools I've designed Incredibly complicated theme parks, world-class office buildings and other facilities, airports. And I'm telling you, there is more happening per square foot and per square inch in a house than there is in any other kind of facility. And if anybody says that, oh, it's, it's, it's simple, and, and they do it in two or three sheets, they are not doing a, a, a complete and good job, in my opinion. As a matter of fact, the state of North Carolina, there's uh, the, the Board of Architecture takes the practice of architecture very seriously. They don't make any distinction as to whether you're designing a house or whatever, and I think that's a good thing. And I've seen architects lose their licenses and be suspended. Enoch, where you're at out in California, do they have like a rogues list publicized by your state Board of Architecture that comes out about once a quarter? They have a list of people that have been censured because of there you go. unethical <clears throat> conduct or basically not following the Architects Practice Act. There you go. Well, same thing here in North Carolina. And I actually practice all over the United States. And I'm licensed in multiple states. And every single state has that same thing. And I've had some people poo-poo what I'm talking about. And I'm here to tell you, boards of architecture enforce this. For instance, let's just make one example. And this is something that should happen in commercial architecture as well as in a residence. But when you have a steel angle supporting stonework or brickwork on the outside of a house, or on the outside of any building. You're supposed to have flashing in there. You're supposed to dam the ends of the flashing and seal it so that water that might come down through the wall is transferred to the outside. Okay, I've seen architects that do a, a really lousy job of detailing homes, that they don't include a detail like that. They don't even refer to it. They don't even include any specifications. They're not even in a note about that. And I've seen them either be suspended or lose their license. So. People that think that boards of architecture don't take such things seriously, just because you're designing a house, it's like they think that the rules don't apply to them. That's not true. And when we're up against you know, so-called designers that don't do things like that, they don't have to. They're not licensed. They literally do not. They can ignore the health, safety, and welfare of the public. There's nothing that requires them to do it properly. And so this is one of the reasons why ARCH exists, to make people aware that they deserve better for the design of their homes. And would they like to be healthy in there? Many people have COPD, mold-causing organisms. I mean, mold is everywhere. It's in you, it's in you, it's in me, it's, it's everywhere. And you're not very careful about how you design things and vapor barriers and so forth. You'll propagate that. And so the design of a house, which is primarily where most people live, a lot of people still think it's okay, for instance, to put in polyethylene as a vapor barrier. Nothing could be wrong wronger than that. I mean, you know, maybe they can get away with it some in some regions of Canada up there, but in, in most, yeah. of, most of the continental United States, you cannot, and it will create mold. I've been called in by risk managers of various counties and cities down south where they've had black mold growing inside walls when I was doing commercial architecture, and we've transferred those lessons to residential architecture, and that's one of the main things you should not do. And so one of the programs in this crafts program, people say, oh, there's nothing to it. No, there's absolutely a lot to it. Mold prevention, vapor barriers, those are some of the courses in Division 7 that we, we sort of break it down like a CSI, Construction Spec Specifications Institute, not 
crime scene investigation, although it might be interchangeable sometimes. And, and so we've broken it down into the various divisions. And there's things you need to know in each one of the divisions if you're very serious about designing homes, because it is a specialty. And if you're designing only hospitals and only high-rise buildings and only schools, there's really a lot you don't know about when you design a house. There's so many technical issues about stairs. There's a tremendous amount of information there about what's legal and what's not and what makes sense and what's structurally sound and what's not. And a lot of it just comes down to experience. <clears throat> You know, how long you've been doing this? I, most of the people in Arch have well over 20 years experience. I've been, I've got about 40. That's four, zero years of experience doing it. And so you tend to learn things. And a lot of people think you get away with not having specifications when you produce a home design. I think that's uh, shameful. I did that once back when I was starting decades and decades ago. And the contractor got away with not using pressure treater wood outside. And some things fell because they rotted. So I said right then and there, I'll never do that again. And so we try to learn from our errors. And so I've always provided specs since then, and I'm really glad that I do. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archieoffice.com. Now back to our show. Yeah. Does, um, does Arch have a list of, uh, your organization have a list of a kind of a mission statement or a list of, of points, of belief points, things that you support? Uh, one of the questions in my head is, uh, do you advocate that um, a licensed professional should do homes, that it should be a requirement to get a license to to design in a house. Uh, Craig, you want to address that issue? Because I, I, I'll go on for an hour on that. <laughs> well, um, we would like to think that every house should be done by a licensed architect. Whether that will would ever happen, I'm not really sure. But the, I think the point is that we need to impress upon people the value of hiring a, an architect. And not, and not just using a designer. You know, the thing you hear a lot is, oh, well, if I hire an architect, I'm going to pay this exorbitant fee and the house is going to cost twice as much and it'll never be in budget. Well, that's personally not true. I mean, if you're doing your job as an architect, you have a budget to work with, you're designing a house to a budget and doing the best you can for what the client wants. So, you know, I hear that all the time. Oh, it's, they just always put stuff in that they want to put in. Well, no, I'm sorry. I'm designing a house for a client, not for myself. They live in it. So, you know, can we get every house? I mean, I don't know if every house really should be designed by an architect. It would be nice if it was, but... You know, it's, it, that's that's one of those those topics that's really kind of hard. I mean, it's well. It's hey, let like, me let me chime in here a second, Craig. Uh, I remember the AIA had some numbers back a couple of years ago, about 2012, and I really don't think the numbers were correct because NCARB says there's 104,000. Right. Yeah. Uh, but as I remember, I remember reading something that maybe I misunderstood something, but I think they said that there was like 220,000 architects in 2008 and then by right. two, 2012 there was like about 40,000 less than that yeah. and I don't think those numbers are right because NCARB's numbers contradict the total which is 104,000 but at any rate I think what the AIA was trying to say is that there has been a tremendous amount of attrition and I know for a fact that there's licensed architects that are no longer practicing architecture because there was not enough work for them to do so you know, if everybody hired an architect to design their home, then all those people, all the attrition we've had would come back in full force. We have tens of thousands of, of architects that would just love to come back into the profession and practice what they love doing and what they're good doing. So I'd just like to make sure that for those that are naysayers about that issue, we've got plenty of architects to deal with this. They've lost their positions because there hasn't been enough. So go, go ahead, Kurt. Well, I was just going to going to go kind of go back to that whole whole issue about spending money. And Rand, you had talked about it at one of our Skype 
meetings also is that, you know, an architect adds so much value to a job that we can actually save clients money just from efficiency of design, efficiency of materials. I mean, there are lots of things that we do that that save client money, regardless of what they're paying us as an architectural fee. Let me go ahead. I think that's important. Let me go ahead and do address that because you're right. I've actually conducted some uh, Excel spreadsheet analyses that actually proves that when you hire an architect to design your home, that most architects these days are extremely energy efficient oriented. For instance, I can't imagine any architect specifying incandescent lighting. Uh, you know, that almost all architects now specify either CFLs or LEDs. They consume a tremendous amount uh, less of, of energy and that in association with improved methods of insulation, appliance specifications that actually exceed energy star levels. We've actually proven that you could end up saving so much money in future energy costs that during the lifetime of the home, which probably will exceed the lifetime of the original owner, about 100 years, an architect design home will probably consume about half the amount of energy as a non-architect design home. And so what happens is the amount of money that you spend in energy during that century will exceed the original cost of construction many times over. So the fee that you pay an architect, you get back during your lifetime in reduced energy costs. And we're going to do a whole series of the value of an architect. Um, we're going to be doing some videos and some other things that display some of these to the public. I don't think other organizations have done an adequate job in explaining the value of an architect's services. And so, once again, we don't need to get approval to do that. We're just going to do it. Well, we, have, we, we get approval through our, our own um, executive committee that we, we have organized bylaws, and, but it's not, we're not going through um, a huge corporation that we're trying to get approvals through. So okay. that is a difference. Uh, you asked what the mission statement was, Enoch? Yeah, I was going to say that. Rand, do you have that in front of you? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Arch is an American organization of licensed architects focusing on residential architecture, professional excellence and achievement, client value and service. Okay, and give me some, what are some reasons why people might want to join Arch? Sure. There's both advantages for the clients as well as advantages for being an Arch member. So those, sometimes they coincide, sometimes they're a little different. The advantages of being an Arch member well, as we mentioned, to our knowledge, Arch is the only independent professional organization in the world composed solely of licensed uh, architects practicing residential architecture. Any other entity that is says that they're doing that, they really aren't. They have non-licensed members as fully one-fourth to one-third of their membership, and we believe that that compromises the uh, goals, what licensed architects are and what they're trying to do. Because when you're in competition with people that haven't paid what we paid in terms of time, Energy, money, it's, it's unfair. It doesn't take into consideration the health, safety, and welfare of the public adequately. So first of all, an advantage is we're solely focused on the needs and the interests of licensed residential architects. So that's one advantage, and that's a huge one because we're not compromised with trying to be all things to all people. Okay, so there's a philosophical approach there that we think is important. We also have a find an architect database to help the public find ARCH members. and. Some of us are already coming up throughout the United States because of their listing on the ARCH database. So that's a good one. And then it's organized in multiple ways, both geographically as well as by specialty. And there might be some other entities that do something like that, but they don't have it categorized into three different silos. We do. And so you're actually listed multiple times. And there's a link. You're allowed one backlink to your website. And if you know anything about backlinks, and how valuable that is with Google searches. That's a good, strong one because Arch is a good, strong, uh, authoritative website. Also, you have the opportunity to have one or more Arch member projects uh, featured on the Arch homepage slideshow. That homepage slideshow is actually at the top of every Arch website page. So we're looking for yours, Enoch. So yep. you need to send me what you want to <laughs> feature. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And we'll put it on there for you. And we actually want you to put your copyright on there. Other Right. Organizations don't seem to make a big deal about that. We do. We think that's very important. You created that, you own it, and we want you to get credit for it. So take a look at how we've done the other ones and do some Photoshopping and uh, send those images. Uh, so, <clears throat> what a, an, another advantage, if I can jump in, that, that I think is sort of one of our, I don't know if I'd say it's our main goal or not, but we're an organization that we would like to think that if you have a particular problem you're dealing with, whether it's a detail, whether it's a client issue, whether it's a contractual issue, whether it's a, a GC issue, is that you're going to end up having 
a database of other architects that you can get a hold of and say, hey, have you ever had this issue and how have you resolved it? And so that, and, and it's for residential architects. So it's not going through a large group. It's going through somebody that is going to have and maybe experience that. And so in essence, it's a large group of friends that can pick up the phone and say, hey, what, have you done this? What's happened? You know, what, what did you do when you needed this? Or, you know, so ideally we're a resource, a large resource for your practice, anybody's residential practice. We we want everybody to feel like we're professional brothers and sisters. Right. <clears throat> and we take that very seriously and also in a very friendly fashion. And we've had members uh, from, we've got members from as far away now. We span the coast now, thanks to you. You know, we had a member, uh, one of our ladies, Lori, is in uh, Colorado, but now you're in California, so now we're mm. the whole way. Excellent. And we have we have members all the way over across the nation to uh, North Carolina and then from uh, Chicago down to Fort Lauderdale. And we had one of our Chicago members have some problems with a, um, a contractual issue, and they were negotiating a contract, and they trying to figure out how to handle some things. We do intend to charge money for the ARCH contract. It's one that that I've been developing for the past 20 years with the input of probably 10 different attorneys. And it is solely focused on residential architectural practice. It is just about bulletproof and it's fair and reasonable. And it really watches out for the best interests of an architect. So you can sleep at night mm. yep. and if, you, if, you're using, about. if you're using contracts from any other entities, they are once again being compromised by trying to be all things to all people, and I question the suitability of those for what we do, and they're welcome to do whatever they want to, and so are we, and we're very focused. We Our form of agreement is three pages, front and rear, so that's six face pages, and that's a lot shorter than other forms you may have seen, and it's extremely full of meat and potatoes, and so that entity, uh, that Arch member started using that form of agreement, and the uh, problems went away. Yeah, excellent. Well, gentlemen, it's been great talking to you about Arch, and I would just like to give you a moment to tell people how they can find out more, and if they're interested in joining the organization, where they go to do that. Uh, www.archhomes.org, and there's just one H in that, A-R-C-H-H-O-M-E-S.org. Okay, excellent. Craig, any, any last words? Gosh, I hate to give the last word. No, I just, uh, we look forward to, to new members and new input because I think that's what we're, we're ultimately striving for. And the more members we have, the more we'll be able to do. So we're just, uh, looking forward to getting the word out and, and getting some, some new, new blood and, you know, basically keep, keep, keep it going. Excellent. Uh I'd just like to mention that we have so many programs we, we, we need to keep developing that I think everybody yeah. involved in residential architects is going to enjoy, like a yearly ARCH awards program. We're going to have our agreement forms on the uh, store that we're going to institute on the website uh, soon. We have focus groups, uh, which we need to get you on a couple there, Enoch. Mm-hmm. And uh, we believe that you save more cash in the savings that you receive from the what, what Arch does for you as an architect than your yearly dues every year. I think every organization ought to be able to say that and make it happen. And so far, we believe we've been delivering that. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. You know, and I know a lot of people, uh, all of us at one time or another, complain about situations that aren't ideal. But I think it is commendable that you gentlemen are taking this by the horns and you're deciding to do something about it. So thank you and congratulations. Thanks for sharing with us about Arch. And I personally look forward to hearing more what you guys have going on. Well, well, thanks very much for having us. And okay. thanks for joining. Yes, thank right. you for joining. You're welcome. Okay, bye-bye. All right. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture.
views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway. <laughs>